from very early on, what he saw happening in American Musical, which was an art form that he loved, was just a lot of spectacle. It was the era of the epic musicals from London. Shows like Les Mis, Phantom of the Opera, and Cats. It was an era of kind of stuff that your parents would take you to and say, what a waste of an evening. So that was the challenge he was facing, ju ju just as a composer and a musician. And his sort of mission was to try to bring the MTV generation and the musical theater world together, which is a very hard thing to do. If anyone was going to do it, he was going to do it, or the art form was going to die. John was very clear that he was going to change the face of American musical theater. And he'd say it to people, and it would sound arrogant or ridiculous or goofy, but knowing him, there was a quiet confidence about him, where in his mind, it was just truth. I think there was something that he knew. At some point, John moved down to Greenwich Street. It was like fifth floor walk up in this very funky building. You had to call him from the phone booth across the street and he threw the keys down. I remember walking into it and thinking, I can't believe the building's standing. It was you know, a pretty unique shithole. I mean, we all lived on six or five floor walk-ups, but it's true, he had the shittiest five floor walk-up of all. You couldn't really call it an apartment. It was more like a loft that had been broken down with walls and a very strange configuration of rooms. The key thing was the bathtub in the kitchen. It was great, you know, if you were sitting there eating a bowl of cereal and someone took a shower, you'd have to move over so that the water would go into your cereal. No heat, it was freezing in there, and it smelled like sour milk. Ugh, yuck. Can't we get a vacuum in here? But they, he loved it, you know, it was perfect for him. It was really bohemian. I mean, it was the starving artist thing, but he wasn't putting it on, this was the deal. He lived a very sparse, bohemian life. <laughs> he worked as a waiter. For about 10 years, he worked at the Moondance Diner. Yes, we do roast eggs, we do every kind of egg you can have. He was actually pretty zen about that job. He never complained. You know, it paid the bills. Everybody knew him, everybody loved him. He had such a good personality. Expert chefs in here, as you can see. Jonathan sort of decided that working at the diner was less stressful, more fun. It was very different from being a word processor at City National Bank or something like that. I started training to wait tables at the uh, Moondance Diner. And they said, oh, you know, you work with Jonathan. He's like the best. And he told me that he was a composer. And you know how you do that thing where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're a composer. <laughs> you know, like you're wait tables. The fear was, what if I don't make it? And what if I'm a waiter? And that's really what I do. You know, he hated it, and he didn't want to do it. And he was thrilled when something came up and he could take a hiatus. You know, he developed the schedule so that he only had to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and that was enough tips to pay the bills on a month. So Monday through Thursday was writing music. Was, Jenna was his girlfriend for most of the time I knew him. Everybody asks, you know, he wrote musical playwrights and she must have been gay. And Janet swears that he was one of the most romantic men in the world. Yeah, Sondheim was the, uh, the dean. Every aspiring musical playwright wanted to uh, be Sondheim. And uh, Jonathan idolized him. I mean, that was his hero. And uh, Jonathan got in touch with him and wrote him a letter, and uh, Sondheim wrote back. And uh, Jonathan held on to every word and note and lyric this guy wrote like it was spun gold. They made a connection so that John subsequently sent everything he wrote to Sondheim for his approval, which I thought was the height of audacity. You know, I would say to him, do you think that Steve Sondheim might have something better to do with this time? And he would say, no. <laughs> He's got to hear what I'm working on. And to his credit, uh, Sondheim always wrote back or phoned back. He was rigorous and always responding and helping him direct his career. The year, 2064. The country, Superbia. John worked very hard and long on a piece called Superbia, which grew out of a desire to do a musical version of 1984. The version of 1984 that he wrote in 1983. Quickly wrote a letter to the Orwell estate and said, can I have permission? They were like, no. 1984 turned into Superbia, and that was a seven-year odyssey. Superbia was sort of a futuristic fusion between the rock musical and your traditional Oscar Hammerstein musical. I mean, it literally had the whole thing, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl again, set in the future, with sort of techno, new wavy music. Face value, face value. Let's hear it, 
superbly. It was so far ahead of its time that nobody could figure out what it was. But if you watched it now, you would say, wow, did he call that one? It really predicts how the broadcast age would eventually numb people to the world around them, and they would just become tools of the media. He did seven drafts of that. Play. We spent seven years trying to do Superbia, and we had done workshops everywhere from the public theater, rock concert version at the Village Gate. It had won a foundation grant, and Stephen Sondheim had come to a workshop of it, and it just wasn't going to happen. It was a huge frustration that it was never really produced, and a huge disappointment because he came really close a number of times. He kept saying they don't get it. They just don't get it. Jonathan's life. You know, working at the Moondance Diner, trying to make a living so that he could come home every day and work on his musicals. Musicals that no one wanted to produce. He was on the edge of turning 30 and spending years and years working on Superbia, and that had come to nothing in a way, since he had nothing except some awards to show for it. Jonathan then spent three or four years working on Boho Days, a 90-minute rock monologue. No one knew what boho meant. So then he called it Tick, Tick, Boom. Tick, Tick, Boom. Tick, Tick, Boom. Tick, Tick, Boom. Tick, Tick, Boom was a way to respond to the sense of rejection that he felt. Tick, Tick, Tick. Boom, boom, boom. I need about a half pound bag of M&Ms. Someone get these people out of here before I have a nervous breakdown. I can't smile any harder and I want to shoot them. He said, okay, screw you, I'm doing a one-man piece, and it was my brother and a piano and a band. Our hero, rock musical writer, food service expert, Jonathan. It's not that I don't share my feelings, I just convert them into songs. Is this normal? Has Dirty 30 always sucked? What was amazing was that he told this story all through pop songs. <laughs> good snapshot of his point in life. I'm afraid of being stuck waiting tables forever. And I'm really honored. I mean, he, um, he dedicated it for me. So he didn't have money for a 30th birthday present, but he said, for my friend with the bicentennial eyes, because they were always red, white, and blue. We did a production at Second Stage for two weekends. Because we did that, Jeffrey Seller came to that production, that mini production, and that was how he learned of his work. The next day, I woke up and I wrote Jonathan a letter, and I said, I love your work and I want to produce your musicals. Jonathan was anxious. He wanted to get something going. And he felt as if if he didn't get something going, he was going to explode. Jonathan was connected to the gay community strongly because his high school best friend was, was Matt. And Matt was HIV positive, and Jonathan was terrified to lose Matt. And the worst part was the fear. It is so scary. Do you think you're going to be dead in two years? You know, the doctor told me to go home and get my affairs in order. You know, I went to the diner and cried on the counter and told John. I took baby steps, and he took steps with me. That hit him tremendously hard, as it would hit any of us, as it did hit all of us with AIDS when you realize that it wasn't just a headline, that there were people you knew dying. Could his dreams possibly have encompassed what actually happened? The fact that it's been all over the world, the fact that it won the Pulitzer. He will forever be known as the writer of this amazing musical. The legacy of that is, is quite astounding. If I think back to what those unbelievable days of sorrow were about and what we were hoping to do, it's very joyous to know that his voice is out there.